What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome into the Orange Zone Podcast. I'm Tommy Sladak. This is Samantha Cross, and we have Brendan Hodges on the producer mic. We are your place for all things Syracuse Orange, and we have a lot to get to, a lot to get to today. We have NFL draft recap. We have SU Women's Lacrosse, a preview on our expectations for the NCAA tournament, and then ultimately our year or season in review for Syracuse Men's Lacrosse because they are done. Now, again, we're your spot for all things Syracuse Orange. If you're watching on YouTube, what's up from the Sky Cam? If you're listening, Spotify, Apple, Prime, wherever you get your podcasts, thank you. Appreciate you guys tuning in every week. Now, Sam, let's start with this. Let's start with the draft talk because after having – no sort of draft conversation last year with the Syracuse football team. We had five players either get drafted or sign undrafted free agent contracts, two of which were drafted, like I mentioned, Matthew Bergeron in the second round to the Falcons and Garrett Williams in the third round to the Cardinals. Bergeron, the highest pick for Syracuse in 10 years. This is the first time they've had two top 75 since when, Brendan? I believe 2001. I think it is 2001. 20 years that's a big deal i think for this program especially looking at the ups and downs that they've had over the last few years oh it's critical and first things first before we get into any of it it. how about those reaction videos oh the best the best i I love them i've watched like like uh what do you call it on youtube like compilations of it of just over and over and over again just different videos it's the best And you include it in your sports cast, so I like that. No, I think it's great for the program. I mean, still, when I look at all of it collectively, the thing that's sticking out to me is what happened with Sean Tucker. Like, my Mm. mind is still on that. I'm kind of curious. Let's get into Sean. So, Sean ended up getting uh, going undrafted and going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He is uh, reportedly... Ended up going there because the Bucs guaranteed $155,000, which... um, uh, in a situation as an undrafted free agent where you're truly guaranteed nothing, it could be you know a few a, a week or two in a camp and you're done. Uh, yeah, go go get your bag when you can if you're getting that chance at the NFL. So a few months ago, I thought I think everyone did that this would be a third, fourth, maybe fifth round guy, but third or fourth for sure. You ask me at the beginning of the senior season, I would say this is someone that could easily sneak into the second round, maybe yep. even higher. Yep. But what transpired after the season ended in this spring with him not being allowed to compete in the combine because of a medical issue, there was that medical read check. He was able to do some stuff in his own personal pro day a few days before the draft. But ultimately, whatever this medical check is, um, brought enough concerns that this guy, an All-American, went undrafted. And you know what the hard part is about it? Is I felt like even just as people who covered him throughout the season, yeah, looking at it through the lens as you're shooting the games as they're going on, there were definitely a couple of times, a couple of moments where you could even tell in the Twitter sphere, everyone was kind of like, uh-oh, looked like a rough hit or he was down for a couple of seconds. But because he would always get back up, and he always continued to play, it was very hard to know where he really stood. You know what I mean? Totally. And and again, I'm not I'm we're not gonna speculate here because this like is obviously a serious situation, whatever it is. But to have something that on the outside isn't noticeable is is strange to me. And for it to be a medical issue, right? And there was, you know, one report of it being something with the heart. And ultimately, again, not speculating, but looking at the situation as a whole, you almost expect it to be something. I know I I had been talking about it since last year that I thought maybe was it something with his ribs because Mm. of the way I've watched football my whole life. I've never seen a player go down like that and be down so bad to then get back up and go back in the game. What's happening with that? Are they even related to what this medical issue is? Again, we, we don't know. And hopefully we get those answers as some of those Buccaneer reporters, you know, ultimately start prying in. And maybe it's even Sean himself sharing it this summer. But it's, it's, I, I'd, be, I'd be really bummed out for him if it is something as serious as that. But for it to be a medical recheck and he's all, it's all, he's all clear, what? How do you explain that? This is, it's new to me. And as you said, no reason to speculate, but I'll be interested to see what the Buccaneer reporters are able to uncover in this situation. 
Big time. Brendan, Any other surprises I was going to say for either well, of you guys? I, I'm going to I'm gonna turn to Brendan on this. The, so, Brendan, um, if you haven't checked it out, cnycentral.com, we have an awesome draft recap article that Brendan was just going after all weekend. On, on his off days, I might add. So this is a man that truly loves the draft, and and uh, the floor is yours, Brendan. What's what's stuck out to you that you think our viewers and listeners would, would appreciate? Uh, I mean, I – not that I was wrong about where everyone was going because that's kind of uh, par for the course, you know. I was kind of surprised Bergeron went as high in the second round as he did, to be honest. I thought that they're like people value offensive linemen. I didn't realize that, like, even a team like Atlanta that runs the ball a ton, and I probably should have put them up there as a team sure. that he could have landed at. But, like, it was always like, God, I really think the Bears are a fit that, like, he would go to. They have a mobile quarterback. I and I, mean, I, I think he would have. I don't think you're wrong with that no, had he fallen. I, I will say, like, I completely forgot that Desmond Ritter can run. Like, the Falcons have kind of been like an afterthought in, in the entire NFL. They got a good one in Matt Bergeron, dude. Like, mm. And they have a couple, like, Bijan on that team. I was going to say, we should make a note for people that they got Bijan Robinson, the Texas running back. They that still was, have Cordero uh, Patterson. They still have Cordero Patterson. But, Cordero Patterson, as he's affectionately nice. called. Uh, but what do, you, what do you – like when you think of Matthew Bergeron and you think of what he was able to show people from playing in a Syracuse offense and it's run blocking, mm -hmm. it's, it's allowing, you know, he's, a, I'm, he, I think there's no, there's no argument in that a piece of Sean's success in his career here, a piece of Garrett's success running the ball is going behind number 60. And so I think maybe that's a part of it is that, the Falcons had a plan that said, if we're able to get Bijan here at eight, let's get a guy that knows how to block for a stud. And I guarantee you that if you ask Sean Tucker or Garrett Schrader what you just kind of proposed, they would both say the exact same thing. Yeah, big time. And and moving on from there, I mean, yeah, again, it was, you know, Bergeron was just, he was a name that people were thinking maybe even could slide into the back half of the first round and you know i was very much clamoring for that and then when it didn't happen i was like oh you know kind of like tugging at uh tugging at the the shirt so to speak like did i was i just really wrong here so to see him go early in the second round personally made me feel a little bit better that there was that draw there not to mention he was the fifth offensive tackle to be taken so certainly it was uh in a in a draft where the edge rushers and the D line have certainly take prominence over offensive line and, and the importance and the longevity of it, clearly this was still a draft where uh, teams wanted to stock up. The other thing that I think about when I think about the draft is, I just wonder how much of it really matters as far as where you actually get get picked or which round you actually get drafted in. I don't know. Like, I just think about people like Tom Brady and all of that, and yeah. I just wonder, what do you think? Do you think That's it, it really matters? That's a point, actually. There are so many people who question. say, by the way, Bergeron's listed as a guard on the Falcons' depth Yeah, chart, that, so that not, actually makes sense. He, he's not going to play tackle. Right, Sam's but, yeah. point is so interesting because time and time again, you hear these draft analysts say, it's not when you go. It's where you go and how they fit you, how you fit their scheme. Because let's take uh, let's take Bergeron for example. If he goes to a team like, and I'm just spitballing here, a team that passes a ton and gets put in as a tackle, uh, Los Angeles Chargers. It, it wouldn't happen because they have their two tackles. If he got picked there and was asked to play tackle and pass set every rep he would not be as successful, in my opinion, as he can be as a guard with Atlanta that runs the ball a ton, where he can have his strength be his first move and then learn to pass set against NFL pass rushers, NFL defensive tackles. It's a great fit for him there. And then you look at the UDFAs, Tucker, Michael Jones, even Andre Schmidt, though kicking is like, hey, you make it or you miss it. It's up to technique. You find a fit that works for you financially, obviously, but also schematically. Right, and and just to bounce off of that again for the people that didn't catch up with the draft, uh, he's referring to Michael Jones going to the Chargers as an undrafted free agent. Again, Sean Tucker with the Buccaneers and Andre Schmidt looking to try to win the job with the Chicago Bears. But let's backtrack for a second and talk about uh, talk about G. Williams going in the third round. I know we're all big fans of him, big fans of just the it, it really all this this whole class has been. It, 
from a media perspective has been so fantastic to work with a dream. um and you just you want to root for them just as as people that you've gotten to know over the past few years and garrett's one of those dudes just stand up guy always patient always gives the time and uh just gave some s uh, amazing quotes over the last few years so i was really happy to see him go in the third round especially considering he had the acl what was your favorite quote that you've ever heard from him oh man I don't know if it's anything that I can remember in particular. I think it was more his maturity and how he approached the first game of the season. If it was that big game in the middle of the season against a, a top 10 team, he just he seemed to have the right things to say, and it reminded you of why he was chosen as a captain by Dino Babers. I love that. Also, his dad's pretty active on Twitter as well, Geo, right? man, yeah. I like that. Yeah, I love that, The whole dude. family's involved. whole family's involved. They travel all the time for his games and when he was at Q's. And so I was just really happy to see that because I think, you know, pre-injury, I think maybe, what do you think, Brendan? Maybe second round? Um, so to high, see him... second, I think. So that... to see him not drop far at all is, is just... Uh, it's relieving. And going to a team where he's going to fit in, like we mentioned with Bergeron, he's not going to be asked to play a ton of man-to-man -to -man in Arizona. That mm -hmm. John Gannon doesn't ask his guys to do yes, that. Sir. Tommy and I know yes, that sir. firsthand from watching the birds the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, a few Super Bowl moments with that guy. But overall, Garrett's going to fit his system great, and I'm excited to see him flourish there. Um, Tucker, it, and again, I think, I think Sean is at the very least on a practice squad this year. If everything works out medically, Michael, I've I've no doubt in my mind, is going to be on a roster. I got the depth charts up here. If you want to like listen to who uh, they're trying to beat out for jobs, do would, would our listeners know any of them? Uh, yeah, actually. All right, who's um, with it? Uh, who do you want me to start with, Sean? Sure. So Sean is going to be going up against uh, like a Rashad White. He was the rookie uh, Tampa Bay drafted last season, who kind of stepped into that lead mm -hmm. back role. Chase Edmonds was in Arizona. Um, and then a couple of guys they may not know, Keyshawn Vaughn, who was at Vandy Products, and Patrick Laird, who was with the Dolphins a couple of years. So right. some opportunity for Sean to maybe even crack the roster there. And if not, the way that running back goes in the NFL, people are signing them off the street like every other week. Think about James Mungro, man. Think about mm -hmm. our guy. Like he was, with the, he was with the Lions, got cut, and then it was, it was immediate when J Edgar and James went down. Got the flight over to Indianapolis. And we go to Mike Hill Jones with the Chargers. Starters there right now, if you're looking at those inside linebacker positions, the ESPN does this like a base 3-4. Eric Kendricks, Kenneth Murray. Murray, first-round draft pick in 2020, did not get his fifth-year option picked up, so he's in the contract year. Eric Kendricks, solid veteran. You're not going to replace him unless it's due to injury. And then it's they have a rookie that they just picked up, Dayon Henley from Washington State. And then there are a couple of guys uh, that I haven't necessarily heard of, but Michael is pretty far down the draft board or the depth chart. You may think he makes it as a special teamer or a guy who gets called up from the practice squad a couple of times. I'd love to see it. And then, I mean, the Bears with Schmidt. You're going up against Cairo Santos. Like I said, kicking is – like both guys can be perfect. You're going to stick with a known commodity. And I still think Schmidt should is going to end up on the Titans roster somehow. The I Titans. have never heard of this kicker they have on their roster. I just have a feeling he's going to end up there. Here's the thing with Andre that uh, I found very interesting. I can't remember if I was talking to you about this yesterday or not, but Andre, as we know, is he doesn't have a big leg. Right. I think his longest was 54 that he hit once. I believe he hit a 50 last year, but 49-50 was kind of that sweet spot yep. that, that Dino let him go. And then anything past that, it was very much meek a punt or you know go for it decision depending on where they were on the field nfl teams they want that guy that can hit 60 but they want the guy but in this age, but let me let me hold on hold I, I on hold you. on hold on but it's the question of are we seeing a change in that teams are more saying i want the guy that is automatic from 40 in mm -hmm. and andre can be that guy do all teams share that that mindset? I don't think so. What do you got, Brendan? I'm thinking more so along the lines of teams being more aggressive going forward on fourth down in no man's land because you don't want to punt from the 50 and risk not only gaining 30 yards of field position. I'm thinking Andre Schmidt is your perfect prototypical kicker now because if you get into that 45 mm. to 55 range, you're always sending the kicker out there in perfect or maybe even slightly less than perfect conditions. 
Whereas now at midfield, or even just inside your own half of midfield, more often than not, teams are going for it more because it's the high, analytics. It's 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 necessary. It's low risk, high reward. The reward being you keep the ball. The risk being, well, the team's only at the midway point of the field. If our defense makes a stop or they score quickly, we get the ball back. Like, right. And it's such a it's an offensive league. People are going to score. Yeah. Just want a kicker that's money, man. Money so, in the big time moments. It's all you need, and we saw a lot of kickers that weren't money in the moments last I, year. I, so I, I it's think, so funny you say that because yeah. all I was thinking about was that kicker from the Cowboys. Oh, Mahar. I was thinking about the Virginia Maher, guys. Maher, Maher. Maher. I was thinking about the guys from Virginia that couldn't make a kick to save their lives last year. Oh, that was rough. Hey, kept Syracuse in it. I actually pulled a few clips from that game. That was a nutty game, man. Friday nights in the dome for football are like I love them. Kind of electric. I, and you know what I've my theory in that because Syracuse fans really enjoy them. That's the general consensus I get. Whereas you have so many schools that you know Saturdays are game day. I think it comes down to two things. We're in a dome. I felt like every day game was the most beautiful day ever, and everyone's inside. I know. Friday nights make sense just because traditionally it's a basketball school. There's normally hype around a Friday night game, and I think that builds into it. But Oh, I think it did too. Yeah. No, I agree. Friday night was a good fit. And the Dome, I mean, listen, in Syracuse, I'll take it. Yeah. Most of the time I'd rather be covered than not. Very but true. it is a little bit of a bummer when we were heading down there together on those days when it is super sunny. You see all the frat kids getting ready to go. I'm yep. like, bum I'm a little bummed out that this is inside you right guys now. You're saying this all and I'm sitting at a desk on those Saturdays watching the game and waiting for you guys to come back. So shut up. It's actually well, funny that you say yeah. that though, Brendan, because Kathleen, one of the people who works at our news station, literally said something like that yesterday. She's also a producer. She was like, "Yeah, the producer's job is to tell people to talk about how beautiful the weather is outside but never actually get to go out and do it she's like i wear a sweater to work every single day because i know it's going to be cold inside <laughs> by the way nuttier game last year virginia purdue oh purdue i uh, mean charlie jones aiden o'connell both got drafted this week. that was i was happy to see that i actually i really wanted uh i really wanted charlie jones as a as a bill or an eagle but um almost was a little bit surprised to see him go that late you know who else dropped absurdly late it was at perry wake forest guy Absolute stud. I guess he had some drop issues. Mm. Never against Syracuse, clearly. <laughs> Last few years have been a nightmare with that dude. Yep. But, um, yeah, that Purdue game, for sure. I actually was I was just watching, like, the game highlights of that. That was so fun. So fun. There were some really good games this year, fun games. In, in the first, first half, half of the season, season was great. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> first half of the season was great. I look back at that, though, and I'm just like, man – Garrett, if, if Garrett wasn't, if he didn't have his issues, if Garrett Williams didn't have his issues. Can you imagine I mean, what happens if they win that Clemson game? Brendan, I was literally just going to say, sorry. I know okay. that that blew you out a little bit. I got some bit. sensitive headphones on me right but now. But it's so funny you say that because in my head, I always think about that one penalty. That one penalty called on Elijah Fuentes, Fuentes Cundiff. Cundiff. Yeah. It literally feels like that penalty changed the course of the rest of the season. I am not playing. Oh, 100%. I really think because 100%. of that whole situation, they didn't win that Clemson game. Brendan, I'm with you 100%. I'm not saying that lost in the game. I'm saying what would have happened if they won that Clemson game. I could see them like having that confidence being like, oh, this is real. I just feel like if they would have won that game against Clemson, I don't think – that the rest of the season would have turned out the way it did. I just don't. I just don't. You want me to try a transition here? Sure. From one team that lost a big game to a team that always loses in the big time. You guys want to try some trivia here? Yeah. Sure. Draft-based. Okay. The NFL draft, in case you were wondering, has been going on for just under 90 years. Started in 1936. Looked it up this morning. In the last 50 years, a Syracuse player has been drafted – in every year, but five. How many of those years came in the current draft format? The years that are bookending those being obviously 2023 is the latest, 1994 is the first in this current draft era. How many of those five years that an SU player has not been drafted have come within that time span? Mm. Ooh. Um. And there's another question off of this one. Well, we know last year for sure. Um, there's another year, I believe, in the 2010s, so that's two. And then I feel like in the Greg Robinson era, there was another. 
Whew. At least three. At least maybe even four. No, Brendan's probably five. <laughs> Uh, what is that? I'm going with to I'm going with I'm going with four. Sam, would you like to lock in an answer for yourself? Yeah. I see what he means, like the knowing Brendan, but five just feels kind of risky. It just seems It's it's it would be it's pushing it in my mind for sure. <sighs> so maybe you're gonna go down, go three. I'll go five. All right. What do you got? Risked it for the biscuit. You know how you guys usually team up? <laughs> you should have done that here because Tommy's right. Oh. It, it is four. Tommy, do nice. you? Nice. The second Bang. question is list those four years. You want to take a shot? Ooh. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, go. Um, you, you had some of them. All right, 2022. Yep. Um, 2017. Yeah. Let this man cook. Let this man sizzle. 2007. No. Mm. Am I in that? Is it, in, is it, it like it, 04 to 08? One of them's in the ballpark, yeah. Okay. Is it 08? 08 is one. Okay. That's three of the four. Hmm. You got two strikes left. All right. So the glory, the glory, <laughs> like the McNabb era, that was like 98. There was guys flying off the board. 99, there was guys flying off the board. 2000, 2001, all good years. It's possible that there's another that's like a 03 or 05, like 03, 04. But I also think mid 90s wasn't exactly hot. But we do know that that one dude that went because of our previous <laughs> trivia was a 1994 guy. So exit that out. feels wrong but 96 no strike two. Ooh. Two thousand five. strike three damn what yeah. was it 2015 oh wow ah. okay and then that fifth year that no one was drafted was 1975 but okay. no one really knows anything about syracuse football from back then well some some people might so, not us oh, not, not us. us no not, not us. us we were born a little bit later um good trivia like that mm -hmm. Thank you. great one. um maybe a little bit biased because i did really well on it <laughs> but hey. yeah right easy for you to say he's good been, trivia yeah. you he's get been it all on right a, as sam would say he's been on a heater lately he's been on a heater love the black with the chain by the way thank you yeah given like the rock vibes yeah no it just is that I, what you're going for i'm always trying to serve up some dwayne the rock johnson vibes Good. <laughs> Somebody Dwayne vibes brings good energy. Dwayne Somebody vibes in the only. newsroom was asking why Syracuse doesn't have an XFL team today. Mm. I I don't really know how to answer that. I uh, he'd be like, "What do you think it would be like if Syracuse had an XFL team?" And I was like, uh, eh. "It just feels like not good." Again, yeah, I don't know if those are the vibes. I think a, I think a, one of the bonuses of maybe having an XFL team is. You're probably wanting to play in warmer areas, so you get that time outside. Like, don't get me wrong, St. Louis has been buzzing, but I think, I think it's more meant for those bigger cities that don't have a team. Um, that's my opinion. But then there's the DC defenders. Oh, I, I just don't think it would do that well. I don't. Did you say DC isn't a big city? No, I. Oh, I, they have I, a team. I retracted Duh, and just kind of said they like they have a team already. Yeah, yeah. Um, you guys agree? I, I don't. I don't know. I just don't. I, I don't mean, think we it, have enough. I don't to, think it'd be the worst thing, but it wouldn't be the best. I think. Thing. I think. I think Rochester could theoretically have a better mm. environment for that. That's interesting. Just because they don't have that football, like their football team is the Bills, so it's like, you know, I've seen the way that the 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 Amherst fans show up there, but um, yeah, good prompt. Let's switch gears. Lax. Let's start with the SU women. They're still alive. They moved down though in the rankings. Um, Number four. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, just have so many numbers in my head right now. I I don't really know what to make of the ranking shifts. I I get it. I'm not gonna fight it, but I'm also like not quite bothered by that as much as I'm bothered by what the heck's going on. Yes. Sam, this is this is the floor is yours. No, I agree with you a hundred percent. I think at this point in the season, it's almost like who cares about the rankings yeah. like that that number is not really all that meaningful ultimately it's not i just don't think it's impacting you that much in terms of like your placement in the bracket no i don't it's think it's not so a either. 64 team right yeah, because no. it's smaller you're going to be playing some absolute 
you know, you're going to be playing some juggernauts. Yeah. No. And I, and I think, you know, it'll be interested to see how, how this, the seating situation works out, but I agree that the bothersome part of this whole situation is just what has been going on in these last few games, because everybody always says you want to be playing your best lacrosse in late April. And then you want that to transfer into May. And it feels like instead of problems being worked out in the beginning of the season and then moving along to having this great team that is absolutely prepared and ready to go, it feels like it all happened in the reverse order. Mm. Or at the very best, maybe they were peaking like right in the middle and then there's just been some some strange things that have happened down the line here. I'm not going to go as far as to say that there are patterns or what's trending or whatever, but I am going to say that in two of the games that felt really big, and really important, they lost them. They lost them in the times where it counted and it mattered against teams that are good every single year and national championship competitors every single year. Boston College winning was a little scary, especially winning the ACC championship. That was scary because they did that when they were down as well. They were down for at least part of or most of the first half of that game I believe it felt like it yeah yeah so I think knowing that teams have that ability to come back and have that ability to believe in themselves from down a couple goals yeah now if you're Syracuse you need to figure out a way to number one hold on to the lead and number two how to claw your way back or fight back when you are down that's something we haven't really seen yet here's I'm not saying I'm bouncing back on this but I'm I'm tweaking I'm tweaking that to say I think they do have that ability based on what we saw in the North Carolina game. I just think the staleness of how that started was you couldn't make up for it. I don't think there was mm. enough time to fully get back there. In theory, yes, um, but I, I I completely agree with you. And I, I look back to the Loyola game. We did see that. We did see them kind of overcome some, some adversity in that game and be able to get it done kind of in a low-scoring, ugly win. But right now, I just I can't put my finger. What I'm focused on is when they go on these streaks of just staleness. Because it happened at the end of the BC game. It was for the majority of the Virginia Tech game, and then ultimately it was that 8 nothing deficit. They had never been down more than four. It just was, in the whole season. It was just ugly. And they went just down ugly. 8 nothing, but then got it to where it was actually 12-7, to and it was like, okay, and they were starting to heat up. But what is going on with these gaps? Because it's happening at the end of the game. It's happening at the beginning of the game. So that, to me, is like if you want to find a pattern – Maybe that's not considered a pattern, but there is a pattern in that when things are going south, they're staying south for a little bit. That's the problem, in essence, is that good turns into great, but bad turns into worse for this team. I don't know why it took so long to figure that out, because obviously they were winning and winning and winning. Yeah. However, it really does feel like ever since that game against Boston College, the regular season finale... It feels like it hasn't been the same team since. That's my worry. We haven't actually seen the bounce back yet. I agree with you. I still think that this team at their best versus everyone else's best is the best team in Division One lacrosse. But you need to have your best games now. Yeah. Moving forward, you need to have your best game every game. Period. I don't know if we're going to get that or not. And there's not really all that much time left to fix it. Kind of have to put a little hustle on that, you know? Maybe they'll get one or two. I'm, I'm trying to think who they'll go up against. They'll probably get a bye, right, you'd think? Right now, they're number four. Um, Is it top four I, buys? I, I, yes. I think it may, it's 29-team tournament, right, Sam? That's, yes. So it may be even top it, I, I five. Actually think it, or top I think it's top three. Mm. I think it's top three. It, it may be top three. And so if they so, might they not. Be, but they you know do. what? That'd yeah. be a blessing. That'd be a blessing. That's part of yeah, the reason so. why I asked. Absolutely. They don't need a buy. They need to play against somebody and win right now. Mm. I hope they don't get a buy, quite honestly. Wow. I'm going to look at last year's I bracket. That. Check back with me on that in about a second. Sure. Because they're probably dying to play and, 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 and make up for this and figure this thing out. My question to you, though, is I can't help but think – BC figured something out in the second half. I mean, we saw it. It was kind of the same play. They were, 
it's it's hard for me to it's it's hard for me to explain this in lacrosse terms because I, I, I I'm gonna do my best here, um, and again uh, visually I'm not gonna be able to provide you much so sorry on YouTube if you're listening, stay with me here. But they were they were able to do something to where, and it's kind of like in any sport, but they had a player that was able to shift one side of the defense. So two defenders shifted over and it was someone at behind the goal of the X. Right. And I believe it was, um, who's a girl from Delaware, uh, freshman, freshman defender. So it's the left side. Oh, on, on Syracuse yeah. superior Clark. Yes. Yeah. So it's superior Clark side. So her and another defender were getting drawn essentially like one of them was going almost behind the goal, like mm -hmm. on the side when that shift would happen, it would open something up like every single time it would open something up because the shift was just off defensively. And I know that they obviously adjusted and tried to make up for that, but I can't help but think that Virginia tech in North Carolina, these coaches saw something in that second half to work with and build their own formula for beating this team. I think some taping and coaching is absolutely at play here. And Syracuse is trying to also figure out at the same time how to adjust. Yeah, I mean, I will say that I think defensively they've struggled. Delaney Schweitzer has struggled. What do you think is going on with that, by the way? With Delaney Schweitzer? Mm -hmm. I mean, a part of it, the more games I watch, I will say it is not to say that these are all easy outside shots and the blame is all or should all be placed on her. Mm -hmm. I would say that she is facing some shots right on the doorstep. I would right say that there. she is right facing there. some shots with no defense at all. Normally, Syracuse likes to play in a backer zone, which is a specific kind of defense, and that's what they normally rock and roll with. However, since they normally do play the same kind of defense, perhaps what you said is true. Now you're facing these teams for the second or third time. They've scouted you. So are you going to switch up a defense that you will feel less familiar with or are you going to take your chances using the same strategy you already used that previously hadn't worked that is the challenge i think when you start playing these teams later on in the season but it's also exciting because it does go to show that you can play a team two or three different times and you are going to have a completely different outcome i mean the difference in between play um for syracuse in that first game against north carolina and the second was catastrophic it was like two different teams um so so did did unc play better yes did syracuse play worse also yes i i really i it's like i'm trying to put my finger on one thing but honestly a part of it all does just like feel mental to me mm -hmm. it doesn't even feel just stale it feels like they're playing scared like all of a sudden instead of this quick ball movement that we've seen and these like shots that are coming from all different angles. We still see little spurts of it, but it's not happening as consistently. That's why I say that I really think that they need to play in one of these first round games because the only way, and this is, this is positionally, this is individually, or it's as a team collectively. I think that if you're going to get out of some kind of a mental slump or regain your confidence, the only way to do that is by playing is by getting those reps again. It's like the same thing on air, you know? I feel like if you're like a little bit worried or sure. whatever, you got to do it. You got to keep on diving in, getting those reps in, and that way you get that confidence back. You regain it. Um, so, yeah, I hope they play in the first round, they and I'm sticking be, to that. They would be the highest seed without a bye if that okay. 2019 so field is still going on. Sam, when you mention like – you mentioned that mentality. Do you think that's causing them to maybe not make the little plays? I was watching that North Carolina game from the booth as it was going on. We were giving updates throughout our shows on Thursday or Wednesday. When was that game played? Wednesday. It was Wednesday. Yeah, and it, there was a run that they made that when Tommy mentioned they got it down to 12-7 and they had a chance to clear and, and someone just missed scooping up a ground ball. And the run stopped there. North Carolina went back on a tear and put the game away. How do, do you think that has played into them maybe not making some of the little plays that we've seen them make, scooping up ground balls to get offensive rebounds, winning ground balls off of draws? Possibly. I mean, I will say that I do think that this team, from a hustle standpoint, normally does a great job. They know what they want, and, they, and they've known that since the beginning of the year. However... It is a really defeating situation to be in when you're down by that many goals. Like, even if you go on a run, I think it just feels like 
let's just say that you do score, you know, as, as they did, maybe three or four or five goals and you're closing the gap, but they still had a long ways to go. You know, like five goals against UNC is not necessarily easy. I wouldn't have said that at that point I felt, okay, they're back in the game. So I think at that point, when you've already fought so hard and you're still losing, yeah. I think it just takes less. Um, it, 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 takes, it takes less obstacles for them to give up. Like, I feel like they will give up a little bit more easily just because it's so easy to feel like things aren't going your way. It's easier to, like, stifle that momentum when the team's already down. You know what I mean? Like, 100%. lacrosse is a game of runs, but if they scored four goals in a row and they're still five behind you, you're not that worried at that point, I don't think. I wouldn't be if I was in North Carolina's shoes. I felt like they had control of that game the whole way. I think so too. And he mentioned just the defensively things feeling off, but like offensively as well, like you mentioned, and like the, the, the confidence in the passing doesn't feel there all the time. It's not that smooth, that tic-tac-toe that we love from this team. We get moments of it, but there's just all of them have had moments to me, the Megans and the Emmas of just, a pass that doesn't feel committed sometimes. Right, and that's the reason why I, I turn to this perhaps being a mental challenge or things that we had discussed might be possible the entire year, even before we saw some of these losses, which was just that if you haven't been in this situation before, it might feel a little bit unfamiliar. I think they need to talk it out almost. Yeah. I really feel like they need to all sit down in the locker room and be like, what are some of the things that people are feeling and what emotions are going on? Like, it's hard to solve... I can a almost problem guarantee as a team. that's had it. That's, I, 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 I guarantee I you guarantee as well. Kaylee Trainer's done that with them, having that kumbaya moment. And, and you're right. I think the the what the doctor has ordered and prescribed is like a 15 to three blowout win. And so I'm almost. You know what? You're right. I'm 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 almost happy to see that they're not getting a buy. Just to, be able to be, just to be able to have that get-right game that they clearly need. They so, need a get-right game. Selection show happening Sunday, so we'll be keeping in tune and, and bringing in an update next week. As for the SU men, season over. Uh, bummer. Bummer for a team that had a chance to get to the dance. Had and Brendan get, was sure they were going to. They I knew you were wrong, Virginia, fella. I just or didn't, Duke. Look, I just didn't think that <laughs> losses against two of the top three teams in the nation should be an indictment on a team that was one of the hotter ones going into those two weekends. Sure. I think at the end of the day... It's a 16-team tournament. That's the only reason why they're not getting it. That is the reason. It's a 16-team, and there's nothing that they were able to prove because you don't have an ACC tournament. Um, That's the real bummer in this whole situation, to be honest. To me, it's like a... Kind of messed up. It's a blessing if you're one of the top two teams. You're like, whatever. You know, let's just get this thing rolling. If you're a team looking for that opportunity and not getting it, it stinks. But, you know, until they expand, you're not going to be having one. Because ultimately, it's just, it's not enough. Was I believe, was it five teams? Mm Mm-hmm. It's just not enough to kind of be like, yeah, you you get an automatic bid if you're coming out on top, especially just with the competitions that's already there. So they finish eight and seven. They still finish the season ranked, and it's four wins better than last year. Like that was a four and ten season in Gary Gates' first season. And I just want to say this for Syracuse fans that I know are understandably frustrated just because of the history of this program, the success they've had, and uh, it's a saying that's that that stays relevant forever and it's that Rome Rome wasn't built in a day and I understand that there was you know that it isn't like Gary Gates system is is a complete black and white flip flip from John Desco's but it's his guys he's still bringing in it's his system it's his coaches it's his players and it's going to take time and I want you to look at this improvement from year one to year two and say Look at this opportunity for year three. Look at what we saw from these freshman players going up against vets that are maybe four or even five years older than them. In, in, in not, I mean, like I, I look at this team and it's, and it's not just um, Michael Leo. It's not just Finn Thompson, but it's, uh, it's, um, oh, what the heck? Joey Zelina? Yes. It's okay. I, I, I got gotcha. you. Why was I blanking on his name? I'm, I'm like not sure. fishing up freshman in my head, I and I'm like, I'm like, there's one big one I'm missing right now. Why can't I say his name? I'm like seeing his face. I got gotcha. you. But that that to me is very encouraging to see what Leo Thompson and Spelina have been able to do. 
<laughs> no, I I agree on I agree a hundred percent. Listen, the fresh the freshmen are it. Yeah. I mean Owen Hilt, he'll be back. There's a lot of excitement, I think, surrounding this this program and it's so nice and exciting to feel like so much of this team's success was freshmen and sophomores that should make everybody in the fan base feel excited even if right now it feels a little disappointing yeah. we all need to at least look at the facts look at the stats and acknowledge that this year was a significant improvement from last year yeah and shout out your boy will marks shout out will mark great job man thought you did a great job the whole year i know you did he's actually up for the uh male player of the year i believe for syracuse athletics nice list there and um yeah man he had some special moments um in transferring in and making an immediate impact just an liu transfer trying to make a difference out just here liu just a downstater trying to make a big enough big old upstate new york <laughs> <laughs> all right y'all that's our show orange zone podcast tommy slade x samantha cross and brendan hodges we will be back next week we'll have the updates on the su women and where they stand and uh and ultimately you know, maybe even getting into some updates on some movement with Syracuse basketball, I'm sure. Maybe by then we'll find out where Joe Girard's heading. Um, Clemson, LSU, we'll see. Final thoughts? Yeah. Lemoyne, women's and men's lacrosse, both competing Go in Dolphins. the NE10 championship series this upcoming week. First games are today. Are you going to be doing a play by Or actually, by first, first game for the women is today. What's today, right, though? Tuesday. Tuesday. Great, great, yeah. great point. <laughs> So we'll know what's going on by the time this episode drops for that. Yes, I will be on the call for the semifinal game this Friday, 4 p.m. Probably going to be a Delphi and Lemoyne, you'd think. But right. we'll see. Let's go. Tommy's asking himself, what is a Delphi? Buddy. BS. Are you kidding me right now? He knows that's an electric matchup. I've covered Lemoyne a lot, my guy. I know the NE10 by the, by the back of my head. Uh, I know. I'm just giving you trouble. <laughs> you better watch it, pal. You're on thin. You're on thin ice with me now. I'm, I'm on thin ice. You're on. You're on thin ice with me, Mr. buddy. D that is the Orange Zone podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining, everyone. We'll see you next week. Peace.